Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Josh McDaniel. I work with the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center, and I'll be uh, hosting and moderating the, the webinar today. Um, first, I want to make a few quick announcements. Uh, first off, I would like to point out that the, this is a webinar series. We, it's a regular webinar series. We have one or two webinars per month, and it's sponsored by three organizations, the Joint Fire Science Program, the International Association of Wildland Fire, and the Wildland Fire Lessons Learned Center. There's a few upcoming webinars. Oops, sorry. The next webinar in the series is uh, Craig Clements is going to be speaking on January 27th about the effect of complex terrain on extreme fire behavior. And then in February, Paul Wirth is going to give a two-part a two webinar, one on February 10th and one on February 11th, looking at critical weather patterns and looking at different regions of the uh, North America and Australia. Uh, in those two webinars. And that's going to be part of a, a series of webinars based on JFSP uh, fire research on extreme fire behavior and a, and a recent publication that just came out um, synthesizing some of that research. Okay. And if you would like to register for these webinars, just real quick, I'll show you where that is. Uh, the Advances in Fire Practice page is a page, uh, one of the Lessons Learned Center's pages. You can find that on the Lessons Learned Center's uh, homepage. There you can see an icon there, the AFP, Advances in Fire Practice, up at the top and then over to the right, down there at the bottom. Click on that and that will bring you here and that is where you can register for the webinars if you're not on our mailing list and receiving the announcements, uh, which we'll be sending out oh, about a week before the webinars. Okay, so on to today's webinar. A couple of things to keep in mind. Um, we're going to have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. So type your questions in. There's a lot of people in this webinar. Uh, we had three, about 350 people registered, and people are still coming in. So there's going to be a lot of questions. So if you're, the better chance you have of getting your question answered is to get it in the queue as, quick as quickly as possible. Um, we'll hold those to the end, and then we'll work through them. Also, the webinar is being recorded, and you can find that link to that recording on the Advances in Fire Practice page. And uh, also, you can email me, my website, my, uh, my email address is there, and I can send you the link after the webinar is over if you'd like to pass that on to someone. OK, so now I'd like to introduce the speaker. Uh, I think you guys are going to, this is going to be a, a very provocative uh, presentation, some very interesting research. Um, by Brett Butler. Uh, Brett Butler is a research mechanical engineer at the Missoula Fire Lab. He earned his PhD in mechanical engineering from BYU in 1992 and has worked at the Fire Lab ever since. He, he and his wife have four sons. He loves studying fire. His outside interests are elk hunting, catching fish, and spending time with his family. His work interests include firefighter safety, understanding how energy is produced and transported into fires, and modeling surface wind flow. Okay, and with that, I will hand it over to Brett. All right, so this is a new uh, this is a new activity for me. I've never done a webinar before. Uh, today we're going to talk about the work that I have been doing in the past. It's been about eight nine years now on the safety zones, and my objective today is to get some feedback. I've got some, quite a few questions we're trying to address right now, and any feedback, comments, criticism is welcome. So the title, How, What, and Where of Safety Zones. Uh, this work is, you know, like most things that, uh, that I participate in, are, it's only due to uh, contributions from many team members. And I recognize uh, most of those people who have participated in this effort over the past five or eight years. Uh, Dan Jimenez, Russ Parsons, Ray Bell, Paul Sopko, Kyle Wold, Jason Forthoffer, Mark Vosberg, Tim Wallace, and Laura Brown, and Colin Hardy. And funding was provided by Joint Fire Science Program and Washington Office Forest Service Research, the Fire Behavior, NWCD, CG Fire Behavior Committee, and the RDNA Program at Boise. It's certainly appreciated. It wouldn't be where we are today without that support. This first image show, is from the South Canyon Fire. And it's Sunny Archuleta looking down <clears throat> at the fire line, which is uh, uh, kind of, I don't know if you can see my mouse, about in this, this area. And uh, if we had a magnifying glass, you could actually see some hard hats, see the crew hiking up the fire line right there. The fire is close behind them, and they, uh, it, as you can see, they've got uh, 
some steep slope they have to climb. And it was just a, a few seconds later where uh, 12 of the firefighters that died in that, 12 of the 14 that died in that fire were caught uh, on the fire line right here. And this, uh, my work in, after this fire on uh, studying the fire behavior that occurred and why, uh, why it occurred was part of the motivation for me to uh, look at quantitative metrics for safety zones. What defines an effective safety zone? And that's what I'm going to go through today, uh, talk about <clears throat> that work. All right, Josh, it's not advancing. <laughs> right, we'll try. There we go. So first question, what does a safety zone look like? Much of the discussion for the past 10, 20 years has uh, been, sent, been, I guess, uh, we've concluded that a safety zone is a place where you can sit down in a lawn chair, eat your lunch, and watch a fire burn around you. And uh, recently I've come to the conclusion, that, conclusion that's not the case. The work that I've done is looking at the minimum size. So what is the minimum size to prevent burn injury? And oftentimes that minimum size is going to result in a situation where it's not comfortable. And I just show a series of slides here uh, of a crew. So we see fire, they're in a safety zone, see fire burning around the edge, <clears throat> and uh, this is what they went through, you know, really dense smoke, uh, trying to communicate in a dense smoke, a loud environment, uh, difficult to communicate, uh, difficult to breathe. Uh, uncomfortable. They're here. They're down on the ground, and some of them are uh, very nauseous. Uh, finally, somebody pulls out. A, I don't think it's a fire shelter. It's like a space blanket. They crawl under that to try to escape from the uh, not from the heat, but just from the smoke and debris. This is probably more. Uh, this series of slides probably is more indicative of what a safety zone uh, would be like if if. Uh, if any of us were caught in a safety zone, rather than being able to sit down, enjoy a view of the fire, watch it burn around you. I mean, it's a little bit sobering and uh, also makes me uh, consider, you know, how would I prepare and what, what do I do when I'm on a fire to, to uh, anticipate uh, safety zones. So what I want to talk about today is just a quick review of some fire physics. And the reason to talk about fire physics is uh, it's a motivation for this most recent work on safety zones, which is really looking at how does slope and wind affect safety zone size. And that's all related to radiant and convective heating. So just a quick review of that. Then I'll just quickly review burn injury mechanisms. Uh, how are we injured on, on, uh, on fires and what are the implications there for safety zones? And then a real quick history of where we're at uh, in terms of safety zone guidelines and a discussion of uh, this new science that we're working on. And then really uh, my focus here is what you can do to help and some questions that I need, we need some help on answering. So talking about uh, <clears throat> the combustion reaction, would an air combine with heat and uh, form uh, and release more heat and then form, uh, release nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and water. That's a simple reaction. Temperatures are, it's plain hot in fires, as we all know, 18 to 28, almost 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, we've, we've made those measurements in fires. Those are pretty accurate. Uh, flaming duration is 10 to 30 seconds, and uh, that's always been amazing to me. I'm surprised that the duration is as short as it is. Although we have measured a few instances where fires burn for tens of minutes, and uh, what you have is repeated waves, a, a surface fire comes through burning the ground fuels, and then later on a uh, crown fire comes through, and that's where you get uh, tens of minutes of burning time. The thing I really want to focus on is this red line. Uh, for every, for every volume, unit volume of wood, whatever your preferred metric is, a cubic foot, uh, cubic meter, whatever it is, for every unit volume of wood you need 6,000 of those unit volumes of air. And the flames are 
uh, the technical term is turbulent diffusion flame. What that means is that the intensity, how much energy is released, and the temperature is limited not by the chemistry, but rather by how fast the air, the oxygen, can meet up with the gases that are generated when uh, heat converts the solid wood, the biomass, into gases, into combustible gases, hydrocarbons. So once again, that reaction, that intensity, is, is the intensity of fire is limited by how fast you can get the air in next to those hydrocarbons that are generated by the heating of the wood. And you need a lot of air, 6,000 cubic units of whatever uh, of air for every unit of wood. That explains to me a lot, uh, you know, why wind is, so, uh, is such a driver of, of fire behavior and also somewhat uh, how slope influences fire behavior. And if we're looking at radiant energy transport, and just the general temperatures in a flame, this is a this is a temperature um, uh, profile through a flame. So around the base is around 1,800 Fahrenheit. Middle of the flame is about 22 to 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit, and then the tip of the flame is 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And what happens above a flame? The reason we don't see it is just that the burning embers aren't producing any energy in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. There's still lots of hot gases on the order of nine, eight, nine hundred degrees Fahrenheit above that flame. They're just not glowing, uh, not giving off energy that we can see. If you convert those temperatures to radiant heat flux, uh, the first thing is radiant heat flux is proportional to temperature raised to the fourth power. <clears throat> so what that means is that you know, if you go from the tip of the flame uh, at 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, you have a radiant heat flux of about 21, uh, and these units kilowatts per meter squared. And what a, you know, kind of a metric for that is that a comparison is one kilowatt per meter squared is a solar constant. That's the most energy you can receive when you're laying on the beach on a sunny day in uh, Hawaii, which is where it'd be nice to be today, given that it's about 12 degrees outside here. All right, so that's the tip of the flame, about 20, degree, 20 kilowatts per meter squared, 20 times the solar constant. You notice down in the center of the flame, the temperature has doubled. You gone from 1,000 or even uh, gone by uh, more than doubled, 2,200 Fahrenheit to 2,800 Fahrenheit. But look at how much the radiant energy emitted by the flame has gone up. It's 10 times higher. It's because of that fourth power relationship. So a couple things here. When we're looking at flames, it's not so critical that you look at these disconnected flaming uh, balls of gases above the above the the more uniform flame front. There's just not a lot of energy that's emitted by those disconnected, uh, you know, flamelets, I guess. And sometimes they're pretty big. The most the the, the largest share of the energy clearly comes from the lower two-thirds of the flame. So we're talking about flame heights in terms of the current safety zone guidelines, four times the flame height. Really, you just want to look at the what you would characterize as the most uniform part of the flame, the lower two-thirds, uh, and not really consider flamelets that are disconnecting from the general flame front and rising the plume above the flame. And then also, it's interesting to see that you know the peak temperatures right are, are not at the base. The temperatures decrease as you get close to the ground, and actually decrease steeply right next to the ground. If if I were ever to be caught in a fire, I would lay face down and stick my nose as, into the dirt as far as I could. That's where the cool air is. All right, so just a couple slides here. Uh, this is. Uh, Fire burning in uh, spruce in Canada. Uh, the the uh, moss here was so dry you could stick down in that six inches and not feel any moisture at all. Fire has a slope about 30% slope. <clears throat> fire is burning up the slope. No wind uh, driving the fire. So look at the. I just want to point out. Look at the times. So this is uh, eight minutes and 44 seconds. Uh, Ten seconds later, you start to see some smoke, and so that's conversion of the solid biomass into hydrocarbon gases. 
And you got to remember there's lots of embers, uh, as all of you have seen fire, lots of embers being generated by the flame front and falling down here. So lots of sources for uh, ignition of those gas, of those gases. And then, so we've got 54, four seconds later, you have uh, enough gases that you get flame ignition. One second later, kind of an area ignition. Uh, another second later, and it's broad scale area ignition. Another second later, and it's clearly everything is ignited. So we're into what, three or four seconds after the first flames that we saw. And then uh, five seconds afterwards, uh, clearly everything's burning. And then that lasts for about 30 seconds, that burning. And uh, decreases uh, over the next um, couple of minutes. A couple of things to recognize is radiant energy, you know, all of that energy generated by the flame front impinges on the solid particles, the solid material ahead of the flames. Very little of that energy is absorbed by the air. So the only things that really attenuate or, or cause the radiant energy to decrease are solid objects that absorb that. Um, could be trees or rocks or um, um, anything else, I guess buildings. And the, the, there's enough energy, at least from, from this type of fire, crown fire, that it converts uh, biomass into gases that then are ignited almost on an area basis. It's, it would appear, if you were there, standing there where that camera was, that the whole area ignited all at one time. <coughs> all right, if we're talking about convection now, <coughs> Convective heating is proportional to the air speed, how fast the air is moving, and the air temperature. And it's really the difference between the air temperature and the solid surface, whether it's your arm or whether it's a tree surface or the ground or a building. It's the difference between the air temperature and the ground. And there's plenty of, uh, if we just see here, a sample of air temperatures measured in a fire. And this is a fairly low intensity fire, probably about, the flames are probably two or three feet tall. And really, all the, thing, the only thing I want to point out here is that flame temperatures very fluctuate very widely over time. We go from almost 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's uh, you know, 2,800, or 1,200 degrees centigrade, 28, 2,500 Fahrenheit, back down to almost room temperature over a second or two. And that's typical influence. If you look at air speed, these are measurements of vertical and horizontal airspeed as the flame approaches and burns by the sensor. And you see ahead of the flames out here in uh, less than 115 seconds on this graph, very little airflow, either vertical or horizontal. But with the flame arrival, we see these huge fluctuations in both horizontal and vertical flow. So you go from a fairly strong flow upward to a second later, uh, a negative flow back or downward, <clears throat> or that's that's horizontal, and then the vertical, the same thing. You have an upward flow followed by just fractions of a second later, a downward flow, and that's characteristic. So again, the convection would be proportional to the product. So the airflow multiplied times the temperature. And just a couple slides here. What I would characterize as convective heating. So this is a wind-driven fire in some light grassy fuels and in some uh, uh, relatively uh, small forest. So uh, what does the convection do? Uh, it easily overcomes gaps in the in the uh, vegetation. The flames are reaching way out ahead of the flame front here in the grass and uh, preheating very quickly and efficiently the grass ahead of the fire. Uh, you can see a relatively deep flame front, and uh, it's interesting that it's um, you know it burns a little bit, uh, let's say, kind of slower than what we saw with the uh, crown fire burn. So flames extend way ahead of the front, deep flame fronts, and convective heating uh, is very very efficient at transporting energy from the flames to the unburned fuels ahead of it just does a great job of, of uh, preheating those fuels and, and igniting the flames ahead of the, the fuels ahead of it. <coughs> Excuse me. So to summarize, here's some measurements of 
radiant and convective heating in uh, real fires. So the dark black trace is the radiant heating, and the gray trace is the convective heating. And these measurements are unique. We really haven't seen measurements like this in the past, and the reason is we've never had a sensor that was fast enough to capture these fluctuations. Most of the measurements, all the measurements I've done in the past, it always appears that the convective heating is some fraction of the radiant heating. What this shows is that convective heating, at times you get that combination of a high temperature and a high velocity, and you get very high convective heating pulses. And a, a fraction of a second later, you get essentially a convective cooling. That would be cool air flowing past uh, the sensor or the fuel. So convective heating can be, as I said, very efficient and, uh, and can be in magnitude much more than the radiant heating. The radiant heating is less, less fluctuations over time, but part of the reason is that the, the sensor that we're uh, making this measurement with essentially sees a hemisphere, so it sees everything in front of it and captures the radiation from everywhere in front of it, where the sensor that's measuring the convective heating is really only at the surface of the sensor. So it would be a point measurement where the radiant heating is an area measurement. So is there, how much energy is there in flames? <clears throat> and does it vary with slope and fuels? Part of this work that was funded by uh, the different organizations, uh, the focus was, you know, we recognize that we we had uh, very little understanding of how energy is produced in fires and how it's uh, transferred from the flames to the surrounding vegetation. So we developed some methods to measure that, and we have spent the last eight years really uh, trying to capture those measurements in all kinds of different vegetation types. Here you see uh, lodgepole pine forest and measurements in that lodgepole pine. We see very high values of the red uh, is uh, radiant heating, the black is the total, uh, essentially the radiant plus the blue, which is a convective. And what this you know, only single data point shows is that, uh, at least for this case, the average heating rate is much higher in terms of radiant heating than convective heating. So thinking back to that graph that showed the large fluctuations in convective heating with time, what this would say is that the cooling pulses of cool air uh, balanced out the heating pulses, and that the the radiation is really driving the fire spread from uh, from location to location. Now, if we're looking at fires in undergrowth under ponderosa pine uh, on flat terrain, much lower energy release rates. Uh, but if we add slope in, uh, 50, 40 percent slope, then uh, you see a, a significant increase, much higher energy release, and could say almost the convection is on the order of the radiation. Grass, uh, you know, many times what you'd see in terms of solar constant for it's 50 to 60 times. Again, radiation and convection are balanced, which you'd expect. This is surprising when I still don't understand it or know if it's accurate, but uh, in sagebrush, it seems like most of the energy released is radiation, very little is convection. This was in uh, southeastern I in Montana, um, sagebrush with a relatively low wind, a little bit of a slope, a 10, 20 percent slope. But these measurements show that it's mostly dominated the fire spread by radiation. So, what is the imp what are the implications? Well, first of all, a summary, <clears throat> flame physics summary. So, 6,000 times the volume of air is required for every unit volume of fuel. Airflow drives the fire intensity. That's what that means. And anything to, that happens to enhance the, the transport, the movement of molecules of air next to the gases that are generated by heating the fuel is going to increase the reaction rate, increase the spread rate, increase the fire intensity. Radiation primarily comes from the lower two-thirds of the flame. So you can largely ex ignore those fluctuating flamelets that sometimes they're relatively large above the, the fire. The relative contribution of convection radiation varies. It varies with the fuel type, it varies with the terrain, and it varies with the, the weather. 
and slopes above 30 percent, there's a huge increase in spread rate. All right, so what are the, so that finishes our fire physics summary. So what about burn injury mechanisms? There's essentially three mechanisms uh, where firefighters can be hurt on fires. One is inhalation of poisonous gases, toxic gases that, uh, you know, poison the body. There's inhalation of hot gases. And what happens there is the respiratory system is, you know, tissues in your throat are burned. And then swelling occurs and asphyxiation. Or there's external burns and the subsequent trauma that occurs from that. You just quickly go over them. Toxic gas is the big one in, in our fires, wildland fires, is CO, carbon monoxide. And, you know, if you ever have time to sit down with me over lunch, I've got a, a pretty uh, crazy story about carbon monoxide inhalation. But the, basically our blood has 200, it loves carbon monoxide over oxygen. So if there's, if you breathe any CO in, your blood in your lungs is going to grab that CO before it grabs the oxygen. And then when it's transported around your body, the cells can't use the CO. They're looking for oxygen and they, they starve. CO2 is not so critical outside the the flame envelope, but it is poisonous gas. It's not really uh, a big factor in, in our flames. Um, uh, cyanide gases are uh, generated mainly by, um, I would say, um, uh, synthetic materials and probably not so critical in wild in flames. But oxygen depletion, now that can be a, a factor. You know, remember we got it, uh, those oxygen molecules are being sucked up by the fire. and uh, 21% oxygen is the, is the level that's in the atmosphere. So you only have to go down by 4%, use up 4% of that oxygen, and you get to 17%, which you get some impaired uh, coordination of, of uh, mental and uh, physical abilities. Drop down a little bit more and you get severe mental impairment and less than 10% uh, fatality. The 17 and 14% are certainly uh, present in fires and around fires and uh, needs to, we need to be aware of it. Not sure what we can do about it other than trying not to get caught like those firefighters in the second slide I showed in that area where there would be a slight, there would probably be some slight oxygen depletion in that area. It takes a long time at the 14 and 17 percent for a significant injury to occur, but there could be some impairment of mental capability. We're talking about radiation. <clears throat> okay, once again, one kilowatt is the solar constant, so that's the max you can get on the beach. Two and a half times that, you have pain in 40 seconds. Uh, seven times that, you get uh, second degree burn injury in 60 seconds. And if we skip there, 25 times that, you get wood ignition. All right, there's, and we've seen from those measurements I showed earlier, plenty of energy in terms of magnitude available to cause these injuries in fires. Uh, if you're looking at whether it's radiant or convective and the time to burn injury, you know, at a level of 20, again, we saw that in all of those measurements. Uh, bare skin, you're going to have injury in five seconds, four or five seconds. If you have one layer of Nomex on, then it's going to go up to 20 seconds. And if you have a layer of Nomex with cotton undergarment, then you're going to double or triple or quadruple that time to burn injury. So this kind of illustrates the, how critical it is to proper use of PPE. Roll your sleeves down, wear your gloves. Convection. <clears throat> so if kind of, I apologize, but if you kind of look behind this graph first and you see this flame, this is on a, I don't know what, 25%, 30% slope. Again, uh, on slopes, flames seem to extend out and what we call attach to the slope. And that's shown in this graph, which is based on laboratory experiments. And what we saw is we had a set of fuel beds that we burned under different slopes. And we saw at about 30 to 40 percent slope get this very rapid change in the rate of change and rate of spread with slope. So we're seeing from, you know, a negative zero to 30% slope. There's a slight increase of rate of spread with slope, but as soon as you get about 35%, that rate of change of rate of spread increases for dramatically with slope. 
right there, that's the reason why slope is critical in safety zones, is when flames attach to the slopes, they reach out and, and are, uh, transport the hot gases and air much further along the slope, along ground, up the slope, rather than in a vertical plume above the fire. So talking about, you know, when is that critical if we have those flames and those hot gases transported up the slope, how does injury occur? And this graph is data from, uh, well, different volunteers, but um, uh, mostly military volunteers. What you see, I mean, really is just the, the impact at uh, temperatures. And remember those temperatures I showed were up to 1,200 degrees centigrade, 2,500 Fahrenheit, plenty of hot gases available to cause burn injury. All right, and we can talk a little bit about the difference if you're right here at, say, 120 degrees centigrade with uh, second degree. You're going to get second degree in about, to what, three or 400 seconds, and you're going to in be incapacitated in uh, about double that. So just a quick summary on burn injury. Convection and radiation, whether individually or together, lead to injury and the injury doesn't it doesn't the burn injury doesn't have to be just convection or radiation either one or the combination of both can cause burn injury in the respiratory system or exterior surfaces all injuries no matter what they are include surface burns you could have a case where uh, firefighters uh, are not exposed to radiant heating but they inhale hot gases well the hot gas would still burn the exterior skin surfaces all fatalities, or most fatalities, are due to respiratory system injury. That's fatalities that immediately have to fire. If you have severe surface burns, you may not inhale hot gases. So if you have a radiation environment but no hot gases, that's possible. You get exterior skin trauma or burns, which will cause trauma and could be subsequent uh, fatality uh, several days after the incident. Proper use of PPE. You roll down your sleeves, you wear your gloves, that's going to reduce time to injury. And finally, the current safety zone rule doesn't consider convection, which is driven by wind and slope. So, a quick review of, of where we're at in terms of safety zones. <clears throat> the, the causes of fatalities uh, on, on wildland fires uh, are roughly equally divided between aviation, vehicles, driving accidents, physical fitness, heart attacks, essentially, and fire entrapments. So I, you know, I use this slide to argue that we need to pay attention to all of these, all four of these factors, and then the extra 11, 10, 11 percent is, uh, you know, snags falling on people or and other things. But you need to pay attention to all these. Um, and, and there's much more work I know that we can do in terms of avoiding entrapments. We look at uh, data, and this was uh, this summary was put together by Jim Cook, but he kind of uh, grouped fatality due to entrapments over the past uh, 70 years, 80 years, and into uh, kind of 10 or 15 year periods. And what he saw was around 1960, there was a significant decrease from an average of around six a year to four per year. And another decrease in 1990, uh, 1990 to 2000. And now we're seeing an increase. So just wondered why those occur and, you know, just some things that happened in 1957. The Inaha fire occurred and burned 13 firefighters. And that's when the term safety zone was introduced in the Forest Service and uh, mandated that all firefighters will identify a safety zone, although it wasn't clear what a safety zone was, just a safe area. And the 10 and the originally 13 fire uh, 10 uh, fire orders and 13 watch-out situations were implemented, eventually expanded to 18 watch-out situations. So it could be that, you know, work practices, guidelines, uh, I want to say reduced fatalities. Uh, in 1990, LCES was introduced by Paul Gleason, and uh, subsequent to the South Canyon fire, there was some major changes in work practices, work rest guidelines, uh, uh, 
mindfulness practices, and I don't know, maybe in some way the work that we did here at the fire lab in terms of quantifying safety zones, I would argue all contributed to a further decrease in entrapment fatalities. Now it was from about 2000 on to 2013 was flat at average about two per year until Yarnell Hill in 2013 and depending on how you average that information into the past 14 years, uh, you could say you, you have to argue that entrapments are going, annual entrapment fatalities are going up. So the bottom line here is we can make a difference by work practices methods. Current safety zone guidelines. <clears throat> so uh, right now there's been three studies published on what is an adequate safety zone. There's the work that Jack Cohen and I did in 1998, published in 98, and that's this dash, this uh, small dash line. So if we're looking at flame height, and ignore the, the units, um, and then this is just the separation distance divided by the flame height. So the four times flame height turns out to be a flat line fit to this dashed curve. What that, <clears throat> so first of all, let's, okay, go with that. And then there was two, these two other studies by Europeans uh, a few years ago. Used essentially the same method that Jack and I used. <clears throat> Came up with a similar shape and, and result, but uh, uh, I guess you would argue that they, you know, a, line, a linear fit to their curve would say four times the flame height is too big. However, <clears throat> I would push back on that. First of all, <clears throat> where these, this linear fit falls down is in what I call this zone one, flames less than you know, 50 feet tall, 20 meters tall, 60 foot tall. In that area, the four times flame height under predicts the area that is needed. Now there are some arguments, I won't go through them today, some arguments for capping this at around four or five, four to six times the flame height in this you know, less than four meters tall flames. So less than, say, 15 foot tall flames. So down in this area, right here where all these three black lines are above the red line, <clears throat> the four times flame height under predicts the area needed. For big flames, tall flames, it over predicts. And it's important to point out that all three models are uh, require a much larger safety zone for small flames. So right there is another reason why we needed to look at updating the current safety zone guidelines, and they're going to be more complex. You can't just do a four times flame height. It's going to have to be some function of fire intensity. Now, the, you know, the good thing about the four times flame height is simple, easy to remember. That's that's good for me. Bad thing, it's radiation only, no slope and no wind. Okay, so that's where we're at currently. <clears throat> and why do we need to look at slope and wind? How do they affect safety zones and escape routes? And the way we've done that is measurements. <clears throat> uh, essentially a three-pronged approach. One is looking at past work, going out and collecting measurements of energy release from fires, and then those measurements have been used to do some computer simulations. So when we're talking about measurements, and <clears throat> I mean this is really uh, the only message here is these numbers, which are represented in these three, these four kind of blue bars, represent our measurements that we collected in grass, brush, tall brush, and crown fires. So in grass, flame heights are one to four meters, kind of in this range, and the safety zone divided by flame height, so this, this vertical axis, plotted that out so it, it right in this area. So that's what that represents. And then the brush plots out into this area, high brush and crown fires. If I fit a curve to that, and I'm really always looking for is confirmation if our theories were in the ballpark with our measurements. This is kind of where I, you know, this is an eyeball is all. I mean, it gives me a little bit of confidence that, first of all, the, the theories are not way off. And the measurements also support the fact that we've got this zone one area and zone two area, zone one where safety zones for 
flames less than uh, 15 foot tall need to be larger than in terms of proportion of the flame height than for really big flames. So in terms of computer simulations, <coughs> we use those measurements to design some computer simulations. And this is just a view of what the idealized geometry, geometry looked like. The top view, just you know, something that's this wide and 120 meters long and with a slope. When we vary the slope and vary the fire intensity and measure how much, what is the gas temperature and the uh, heat flux, convective or radiant, different distances up the slope. When we look at that data, this is what we get. So a couple things here. The dashed lines are for the radiant heating only. <coughs> and the solid lines represent the uh, total heat flux. And really, that's what we should focus on is the total heat flux. <coughs> All right. So a couple things to point out here is for the dashed lines, the radiant heating, say there's less, you know, it seems to be a, a, a dependence of the energy load. This is the energy, this is the actually the distance that you need to be away from the flames. A, de a dependence on wind, but not a real strong dependence on slope. However, with the total energy, you know, you see this kind of steep decrease along this 125 line with decreasing wind and with increasing slope. A decrease in terms of if you go with slope, you have to have a larger safety zone. More dependence in terms of total heating on slope than there was for radiant heating. Okay, so just remember that. So another thing to point out here is <coughs> Down in this low low wind, low slope region, and just a good conversion from meters per second of wind to miles per hour is just a factor of two. So if you take six meters per second, it's about 12 miles an hour. This low slope, low slope, low wind region, the radiant heating, you know, if you kind of draw a smoother line through the 20s, matches the total. And that's this separation distance. So what that says is the model that we're using uh, says, you know, and you would expect with low slope and low wind that it would be dominated that, you know, most of the convective energy is, you have a vertical flame, so flame, the convective energy is going up, so radiation would dominate, be the primary driver. And that's what this says. <coughs> now, if you go to higher slopes or higher winds, no, low slopes, what I say here is that the radiant is uh, one third or one fourth of the separation distance for the convective or for the total heating. All right. So here's where the big leap of faith comes. If the separation distance, the safe separation distance or safety zone size, <clears throat> I'm making the assumption that it's proportional to the energy uh, released. And these two differences in sizes say that, okay, yes, that's true. And then we can extrapolate and say, okay, then our four times, if we need four, t the, this, this, the area, the distance needed for the total energy release is four times what you need for the radiant, then our model should say that we're four times what the current guideline is. I don't know if that's clear or not, but that's, I'll go a little bit more into that. So what I came up with <clears throat> in terms of a rule is that I wanted to get away from flame height. And the assumption, another major assumption is that flame height is two times the vegetation height. So remembering that uh, the current rule is four times flame height. All right, if we, if we get rid of flame height, uh, we make the assumption that vegetation that flame height is two times vegetation, then we just multiply the four times two. And that would be, then our, the current rule, the current guideline would be eight times vegetation height. Does that make sense? All right, so what we have is eight times the vegetation height times this factor that's extrapolated from this comparison of radiant and total 
distances for radiant and total heating. It's extrapolated from that table. So right here, uh, let's just pick, let's say for a high wind, high winds, high slope, we're up in this region. And our, our difference between the radiant and the total is about four and a half times. So that's where the four and a half comes from. So we need to be eight times the height of the vegetation times four and a half. All right. Down here at low wind, low slope, then the radiation, the distance for radiation only is about is a little bit less than that for total. So I'm saving the saying about seven tenths times is our factor. All right. And these numbers are different than what was released in July to the Joint Fire Science Program. And the difference is only due to further examination of the results from our computer simulations and some refinement. So that's why we said a preliminary pros proposed rule. If we convert those <coughs> numbers off that table into areas, so looking at circular size in, in acres, uh, this is for 10 foot tall vegetation. So we use a value of 10 for our, our vegetation height times 8 times the factors here and then convert that into area and two conversions. We're using SSD as safe separation distance. Use it as a radius for the area of the safety zone or as a diameter. And what you see is okay for 10 foot tall vegetation you know uh, at um, moderate winds say 10 mile an hour and a steep slope you need about four acres if you use that distance as a radius or one acre if you use it as a diameter. And this is one discussion I'd like to have. I'd like to have some input on. Should we use radius or diameter? I mean, uh, certainly radius is more conservative, but <clears throat> there have been instances where firefighters have deployed and uh, uh, have been in a safety zone and have been able to move from, as the fire burns up to one side of the safety zone, they move to the far side. As it burns around the safety zone, then they move back to the side where the fire was and is no, is no longer. So they can move back and forth in safety zones. It's certainly a much more risky approach and less conservative. All right. All right, let's do a, another case study here. Let's say we've got bigger fuels, taller fuels, 50 foot tall, lodgepole pine, significant beetle kill, 15% uh, slope about 300 feet away. What are we going to need in terms of it? If we run those numbers, <coughs> come up with these areas, either radius or diameter in acres. Okay, low slope and low wind, you need five acres. Moderate slope, you need five acres for a radius or one and a half for diameter. Moderate slope, flat terrain, 25 acres. Here's where the real, I guess the challenge comes in. How do we interpret this? Once you get to any significant wind or slope or both, the areas are don't exist. Uh, they, they're not possible. What are the implications? So this is a question I like your input today. What are the implications in terms of tactics? How do we communicate that? And how do we implement that in our practices? So in terms of that, that case study, that 50 foot tall lodgepole pine, and this is what they did on a fire uh, this past summer. They built a 24 acre safety zone. And the logic for doing that was uh, made some sense. It was a kind of a remote location, difficulty egress and, and access, potential for fire to get down to the bottom of this drainage and run up this uh, slope and cut off uh, escape routes. There was pushback from the uh, forest supervisor's office. You know, why are you building this huge area? Uh, the costs, it's a huge impact. It's going to be there for a long time. You know, what, are, what other options do we have? What are the tactical options? And that was some of the, these are some of the questions I was asked uh, when this occurred. So another question, in terms of this safety zone that was built in Oregon, <clears throat> is it far enough from the slope, from this break in the slope that you see down in that drainage, that you don't need to worry about the slope? The slope in the area of the safety zone, 
right where it was is 10 to 10 percent, so a relatively low slope, maybe not a factor. Or is it a factor? That's a question that uh, we need to continue looking at and need some input on and really can only characterize through measurements and more computer simulations. So if you're looking at this, you know, in ter terms of South Canyon, the safety zone was right at the top of this uh, relatively sharp ridge and peak. That's very different than this location, and ideally the application of whatever guidelines we come up should take into account these types of terrain features. So there's some questions we're trying to address right now, but it complicates complicates how it will be implemented and how it can be used. So about done here, you know, and, and the answered questions. I'd like some feedback on, do we go with a diameter or a radius calculation, or we'll just leave it up to whomever is using it and provide a distance? Uh, tactical options in terms of tall, you know, fuels that are 30 foot, 40, 50 foot tall where you need tens of acres uh, do we need to provide or suggest tactical options, or is that clear to uh, ops chiefs, div, div soups, that kind of thing? Education, it's not going to get simpler. The, uh, the question and the answers are just going to be more complicated. Uh, and uh, what's the best way to communicate the findings from this work to the operational folks? Uh, so that it can be implemented effectively and uh, as quickly as possible. <coughs> Yarnell Hill, to me, uh, really emphasized how we cannot, and I feel like as an agency, we've been separating the issue of escape routes from safety zones. They only work when they're considered together. Uh, an escape route is ineffective unless you have an adequate safety zone at the end, and an adequate safety zone is of no use if you can't get to it in time. have to be considered together, and there's a lot of work to be done in terms of escape routes. How do you characterize crew, tr crew travel rates as a function of terrain and uh, trail condition? How do you mark those? How do you identify those routes? Uh, we have a very limited data set, and you know I showed that what I would call an experimental model for safety zone based on our data. But that you know it has some slopes, a very few data points from slope, a little bit from wind. Most of it's from low wind, low slope conditions. We need more data uh, in on slopes and winds and high intensity fires. And as I said before, we need to do a lot more work on studying what characteristics define and effective escape route. What's coming up in the future? Uh, there's been some work, some work being done at the University of Utah and other uh, locations looking at uh, using uh, vegetation information to identify escape routes ahead of time. And you could uh, kind of visualize maybe another layer in land fire or something that would show these openings in, ve in vegetation and characterize them as uh, potential safety zones for fires of different intensity. Similar thing being done in terms of characterizing uh, travel times uh, to these to these safety zones and sizes of them. We're working on a, a digital device app, a phone app, where the user, if they're can, they have connectivity, it can uh, you know they can either input a slope or it automatically grab the slope from uh, terrain data. They can input a wind speed or it will get a wind speed from uh, forecast data and fuel heights either input or uh, captured from uh, veg layer information, and then provide a, a distance, a safe separation distance, and areas. And even if you have connectivity, it could show you a map that uh, shows the required distances or areas as a function of veg type or location on the terrain. I'm excited about that. I want to see how, it, if it's useful, how it can be used and how we can improve it as a method for communicating what, as I said earlier, is going to be a fairly complicated uh, calculation. You know, most entrapments occur en route to safety zones, so, you know, that kind of questions, uh, raises the question, 
how much effort do we need to put in safety zones or uh, certainly I think more importantly it points out we need to focus on escape routes with equal uh, energy and focus as our work on safety zones. You know, a slope is only relevant when a safety zone is directly on the slope or when is it relevant? How close to a break in a slope uh, do you need to be before slope is critical and wind? And then kind of a summary is if the vegetation is taller than 50, 40 or 50 feet with any slope or wind, then you, know, you can't build them big enough. And certainly, you know, there's areas of 100 acres or 200 acres. At some point, if you're 30 or 40 acres, you would say it's big enough for everything. Well, what is that point? We don't know that. We need to find that out. I hope that uh, this is useful, and uh, I welcome any feedback, either now or in the future. Um, criticism, uh, ideas, uh, there's still a ton of questions to answer. But as you know, the slide that showed uh, fatalities over the past 70, 80 years, you know, I'm convinced we can make a difference. Uh, we can save some lives with uh, implementing uh, findings from this work in, in our work practices. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Brett. That was, uh, that was very interesting. You've raised some very, very provocative questions here, and I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of comments and questions coming in. Um, we have a few. I'll go ahead and start working through them because I have a feeling there's going to be a, a queue. Uh, most, we have getting quite a bit of comments, but there are a few questions. Um, Jeremy Nelson asks, at 17% or 14% O2 depletion, what would, be what would that be relative to altitude or elevation, such as in mountaineering? Thinking of mental awareness, ability to critically think, and, and decision-making skills. Well, uh, the the percentage of oxygen in the air doesn't change with altitude. It's just the overall quantity, I guess, the partial pressure of air. So, you know, you're still at 20% oxygen in the air, even if you're at uh, top of Mount Everest. Um, so the impact is essentially those oxygen molecules that are used up in the in the reaction in the chemical reaction with the uh, gases generated from heating the fuels and so what you'd imagine is that you know in most cases around wildland fires there's a strong indraft because it needs 6,000 times the volume of air that uh, the volume of fuel that's burning so lots of indraft and that's bringing in fresh air that's at 20 percent oxygen content that's why I mentioned that it can be critical in areas where you're close to flames or maybe terrain features where that indraft is obstructed. And I guess a warning, kind of a warning uh, signal would be if you're in dense smoke, then there's a potential for some reduced oxygen levels in the air. Generally, I don't see that as a major issue uh, in terms of safety zones, but it's something to be aware of if you're in a situation where, let's say you're in a safety zone, it's really smoky and somebody is you know, starts acting really funny, I would say the first thing to do is get down the ground, faces down, that's where the highest oxygen content will be and the least reduction in uh, oxygen content. Okay. Um, we have a bunch of comments, so I'll, I'll read them out, and if you'd like to add something, you can go ahead, and if not, we'll just keep moving. Um, Thomas Fielden says, I think we should leave it up to the operations or division for, for, the radi for deciding on radius or diameter. Okay. Uh, read it. Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly open to that. Uh, there was some comments also I've got from uh, operational folks that there needs to be a, a way to uh, uh, account for local conditions or maybe fire intensity. Um, you know, I tried to simplify that uh, table, that kind of slope wind table as much as possible, but there's a potential you could include maybe high, low, or low, medium, and high fire intensity uh, adjustments in there. Uh, so I'm going to throw this question back out. Is that something we want to do? I agree. Uh, you know, I'm certainly fine with leaving it up to the local uh, fire managers, operational folks, to determine whether they use radius or, or, or uh, uh, diameter in terms of that safe separation distance. And maybe what it means is that the radius, when you're using diameter, using the safe separation distance as diameter, it's closer to what would be termed a deployment zone rather than a safety zone. Okay. 
Uh, Reva Duncan has a comment. She says, I, I believe it's more critical for this to educate agency administrators. They're the ones with often limited fire experience, and they are the ultimate deciders. They need to understand the consequences of engaging in suppression tactics with limited true safety zone availability as your ponderosa pine egg as per your ponderosa pine example. They need to know the risks they are asking fire personnel to take on. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I'm not sure uh, what to say about that, and I certainly agree. And I, you know, any suggestions on how to communicate that to agency administrators uh, is welcome. Okay. Um, and this is sort of reinforcing your point, but Thomas Field says, we have to admit that there are places that do not have adequate safety zones and we just we must adjust our tactics accordingly. Yeah, boy, I think that hits a nail on the head. I think, uh, well, I need to be a little careful here. Many times uh, the, the tactics that we take uh, fly in the face of adequate safety zones. I mean, and I know there's ways to mitigate that, but maybe uh, we need to just, as an agency, reinforce that mitigation measures, you know, certainly need to be considered. And uh, rather than, you know, I guess one thing that I've seen in the field is talking to experienced firefighters, asking, okay, how do you determine what's an adequate safety zone for your shift, your assignment for the day, for the, the work shift, for the morning and afternoon? They say, oh, we just know. You know, we've got enough experience, fire experience. We just know what we need. That's fine, and that's good. It's based on experience, but how do you communicate that to others, maybe less experienced, or uh, other people that have a different view, other crews? Uh, I think we need to do, and there's a lot of benefit that can be gained by uh, quantifying how those determinations are made. And, you know, sir, I'm not saying that I have the answer, but what I am saying is that we're looking for the answer, and I'm, uh, any feedback on how to adjust our findings is, wel is welcome. Okay. Eric Johnson has a comment. He suggests using radius rather than diameter. He says this allows the operation folks the ability to refine it based on the actual terrain and fuels. Often the topography is such that the downhill radius must be far larger than the uphill, or the safety zone is on the border between fuel types. Sure. Yep, I, I agree with that. And, and maybe uh, maybe the message here in the last in a couple comments here is certainly need to leave uh, options for local fire managers, fire leaders, uh, tacticians to make determinations on how these findings are applied on the ground. Okay. Um, There's a question from Fermin Alcacena, and he asks, uh, what about using your SSD findings for fire risk mitigation on WUI or other highly valued resources? So the WUI is an interesting uh, application of this work, and we have not considered at all uh, structure ignition mechanisms in terms of determined safety zones. Uh, but certainly you could, with a slight modification in our work here, you could say, look at uh, structure ignition, you know, clearing distances uh, from structures in terms of structure materials. So to prevent structure ignition, now if you're talking what are, what are safety zones in urban areas, while on urban interfaces, then there's, uh, I think, an additional complexity is when is it appropriate to use a structure as a safety zone, when is it not? So, sir, I think there's a lot of work to be done in that area. Okay. Um, somebody, there was a, one uh, question about, is this PowerPoint going to be available? Um, you, everyone can certainly contact Brett and ask him about that, but we will have the recording of the webinar available if you'd like that. It'll be on the Advances in Fire Practice webpage after the webinar. A uh, comment and a, um, a question from Larry Sutton. He, said, yeah, he says, it seems to me like the major implication of your work is that it's telling us in most of the places we currently operate, there is no such thing as an adequate safety zone according to the new formula. But aren't these safety zones designed for worst case fire behavior and shouldn't we be able to predict when that's likely or possible? Right, so a couple considerations here. I think that, uh, you know, the, the question just gets more complex, but we need to, are we asking what is the appropriate safety zone for the next 
work shift, you know, if we're assigned to, you know, thinking of for the morning, uh, then it will be likely different than what is needed for an afternoon, at least typically in the West United States in the afternoon when you see different fire behavior. Or if you're looking at a safety zone, in the case of the pictures of the images I showed for that fire in Oregon, they were considering potential of a change in fire behavior, significant increase in fire behavior that was out three or four or five days. So is the uncertainty in the information they use to make the decision increases as you have less confidence in, in that data then you certainly need to expand uh, you know the assumptions that are included in the safety zone and, and go for larger more conservative approaches so yes you know Larry, I think Larry is kind of arguing that uh, we need to leave some options for on the ground folks to make determination on what's appropriate and I'm all for that um, uh, it may be that the four times flame height, you know, the good thing was that was tied to actual observable fire behavior, but it, the bad part of that was you had to expect or estimate what the fire was going to, the fire behavior was going to be, the flame heights were going to be ahead of time. And uh, that's, that's, you know, there's been some studies done that show that's very, very difficult for firefighters. So uh, I guess a long answer to your question, Larry, is that, uh, the question becomes more complicated. Uh, it's my intent that we leave options for for operational folks to make uh, determinations uh, of a particular application of these of this information to their specific circumstances. But we've all got to be aware that if we're looking at something for the morning or for the afternoon or out a day or two, that the the methods to make those determinations are very different. Okay. And Thomas Fielden has a, a very similar comment. He says, Lo local conditions is also a good tool to use when determining size of safety zone. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was a comment that came from that fire in Oregon. Uh, you know, uh, Sue said, you know, we really, uh, he even suggested maybe we need to have some, you know, kind of safety zone guidelines based on regional vegetation types, terrain types, and weather conditions. It's not clear what route to go, but uh, I think we need that option. Um, next uh, is a comment from Jose Luis Duce Aragues. Sorry, Jose, if I screwed your last name up there. Um, and he's commenting about the the uh, when you earlier you mentioned that um, experienced firefighters say they all know what is a, an appropriate size of a, of a safety zone. And he says, yes, I've heard that thousands of times, but at the end, nobody knows in stressful situations. So well, that method. would be my argument. I mean, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I think we, it would be very interesting to, to, to uh, kind of pick the brain of, of type one crews and superintendents and uh, find out if we can determine, maybe through social science or so how do they make this determination? What is the what is what are those determinations based on? And then quantify that, uh, meld that into the more I guess numerical work, uh, direct measurements that we've done. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay. Um, Taylor Stevens asks us if you could discuss the concept of temp of temporary refuge area versus safety zone. I don't know what I mean. What does he mean by or her mean by a temporary rest, uh, temporary area, temp temporary uh, rescue or a refuge area? Uh, is that a deployment zone? I mean, I was I was asked, I was told by uh, uh, an IC on a fire this summer that I don't care what a safety zone is. I wanted to know what the deployment zone is, and there's an argument for that need to know that you know in an emergency situation you need that absolute minimum size that will work and then you shoot for something that size or bigger and uh, so do we want to focus on a deployment zone to me that's a little bit more risky because there's so many assumptions built into the safety zone uh, analysis that is as it is if we try to kind of tighten down the screws there and uh, sharpen the pencils I, we run the risk of underestimating the sizes but I, I will be open for more discussion on do we look at safety zone or deployment zones instead of safety zones. 
Um, Taylor provided a little clarification. It said uh, you mentioned using a structure as a safety zone, but that would but would not be sufficient for that. It may, however, provide a temporary reprieve. Yeah, and that's just based on the uh, work that's been done that's shown that uh, generally structures <coughs> ignite and uh, are substantially involved in fire long after the wildland fire has uh, gone by. So that you know, it's it's gone by, it's it's moved on to another location. So, <coughs> in that you know, from that standpoint. You could uh, you could say well if there's a fire burning around structure you could go in the structure and uh, hopefully the structure doesn't become substantially involved in fire until after the wildland fire is gone moved on and then you could move outside uh, but there's lots of risk associated with that too. Okay. Uh, Sam Wild asks, do you see a benefit from having a PTB and qualification developed so fire managers could order a qualified person on the fire to analyze adequate safety zones similar to FBAN? Well, I guess I don't know if FBANs are overwhelmed or safety officers are overwhelmed with other duties. Uh, um, I mean, from my standpoint, the research question standpoint, I would love to see that happen just to provide more feedback and information to me in terms of a research scientist on, uh, that I could use to more closely develop this work. Um, you know, in terms of developing, <coughs> developing or implementing a formal position in the ICS program, I, I you know, I can't answer that. Okay. Um, another uh, question from Larry Sutton says, do you think that safety zones that have been used to date have been assessed as adequate because they were never really tested by the most extreme fire behavior that was possible in that area given the fuels, terrain, and weather? You know, I, I guess I don't know. We need to look at, uh, <clears throat> as I said earlier, it seems to be a majority of entrapments occur not in safety zone, zones, but in route to, to some area, whether it's an adequate safety zone or a bus or a buggy or something that's going to get, or oftentimes they don't even know where they're going, they're just trying to get away from the fire. Um, I don't think that we, uh, I think there's still some data, some information available in terms of entrapments or even, uh, even in uh, fire kind of uh, <clears throat> intensity changes where firefighters haven't been hurt but uh, potential has existed there. We haven't captured that information adequately, adequately to say, you know, for instance, if a crew goes to a safety zone, they don't deploy shelters, and everything's fine, nobody's hurt, are we recording that information? I, I haven't really seen that. I don't know. I mean, in some cases, if it's a, a significant event, then we do a facilitated learning analysis, but I, I suspect there's many instances where this occurs where we're not getting that information. It would be useful to have that. Yeah. Okay. Duncan Heathfield asks, uh, can you reduce the acquired size of the safety zone by doing something else instead of clearing fuel, like digging a trench or putting a concrete shield? Uh, yeah. Certainly anything that um, you know, well, we're you know, talking of, whether you're on a slope or a flat terrain. Flat terrain, where it's radiation driven, then anything that would absorb the energy uh, before it reaches the firefighters is, is going to be uh, beneficial. On slopes where you're talking convective heating, airflow, then obstructions like that would be less beneficial. You know, in terms of road cuts, <clears throat> you know, certainly there's there's a bit of a benefit that's derived if you're going to deploy a fire shelter to do it at the inside edge of the road cut. Um, the air tends to flow above and over that cut rather than the outside edge of the road cut. Um, next to the slope, the, um, there's certainly things that could be done. You know, selecting areas that, uh, in, like 30 mile fire, those firefighters uh, <clears throat> went to the edge of a large rock scree slope and a road, and you know, it could have been. I don't know that. We don't know, but it could have been if uh, you know they would have gone to the center of that rock scree slope, that then there would have been a different in outcome, of, uh, less uh, fewer injuries or fatalities. We don't know that for sure, but 
Um, there's things you can do in terms of selecting safety zones as far away from vegetation as you can, get in the middle or as far from any burning vegetation as you can. Okay. Well, Brett, that's all the questions we have. There's quite a few there. Thanks for working through those. I um, want to thank you for a, a very interesting presentation. You raised some great questions that I think we'll, people will be talking about for, for a long time, and we we'll look forward to hearing some more of the results coming from your research. You're welcome, and as I said, uh, certainly feel free to send me, uh, either call me or send me emails with uh, additional questions. Okay. I'll, I'll kind of, any input is, is, uh, uh, is um, welcome. All right, thanks, Brett. And to the audience, I just want to let you know, that, again, just to remind you that the recording will be available on Advances in Fire Practice here coming up shortly. It takes about an hour and we get it uploaded. Um, and that will be stored on the Lessons Learned Center's YouTube channel, so you can pass that link on to anyone you think might be interested. And thanks, everyone, for coming, and thank you, Brett. You bet.